Welcome back. I'm Seema Iyer Esquire, and this is a very special edition of The Docket, The Science of Serial. And we are analyzing the case of Adnan Syed, the defendant at the center of the Hay Min Lee murder. With me is Adnan Syed's advocate, attorney Rabia Chowdhury, who brought his case to journalist Sarah Koenig, and thus the serial podcast was born. Attorney and blogger Susan Simpson, who through her blog, The View from LL2, has independently investigated every single detail of this case. And joining us, forensic pathologist Dr. Bill Mannion, who has reviewed all of the autopsy-related evidence pro bono just for us. Welcome back, everyone. Okay, so let's start off with the autopsy. What is an autopsy? An autopsy is a very careful examination of a body to try and determine, first of all, how did the person die? Did they die of a heart attack? Did they die from some type of trauma? Did they die perhaps of nothing you can see? Perhaps it's a drug overdose. First you try to determine the cause of death. Then you try to determine the manner of death. There are five manners of death. Natural death, you have a heart attack or stroke. Accidental death, you could be hit by a car or get electrocuted at home. Suicide, one takes their own life. Homicide, someone takes your life. And then finally, undetermined is the fifth manner of death. We just don't know, need more facts, need more information. And when you get a case, let's say a forensic case, that it could be criminal, uh, criminally related, a death related to a crime having occurred, are you used to getting a lot of paperwork? Yes, we, we should get From the police? Absolutely. And, and to be honest, uh, as I was listening to your prior show, when they mentioned 314 homicides, I thought to myself, wow, that's a homicide every day, and that does put a strain. In Baltimore County. That's correct. That puts a strain not only on the police, but on the forensic pathologist. So let's get this case cleared. Let's try to figure it out as fast as we can and get on to the next well, let's case. look at the first uh, exhibit here, and that's the uh, autopsy disclosure form. So tell us about that, Susan. This is another example of the prosecutor's policy of not having experts write down findings, and instead having them orally repeat findings to the prosecutor, who then summarized them and gave them the defense. Here we have the only, other than the autopsy report, the only expert's findings regarding the body. There's two lines. Uh, they both say, Dr. Rodri, the forensic anthropologist, and the and me say that the state of the body was consistent with the last date of her disappearance. In fact, at trial, the medical examiner contradicts that. She says that she couldn't find anything totally inconsistent, but will not say it was consistent with the time of, with the last known data. Yeah. Yes, I, first of all, I have trouble with people that want me to just uh, give a verbal summary. I mean, I, I do autopsies uh, sometimes. I've done four this week. And a, if I do an autopsy, I have to sit down and dictate all my findings. Because right. by the time I move through the next and the third or fourth autopsy, I can't remember what I did. Exactly. Let alone so months have to take later or years later. Notes. Absolutely. And, and dictate it as carefully as possible. And you know in a case like this, you're going to be going to trial. So you better be as careful as possible. What are your thoughts on this disclosure? It's, uh, it's something the prosecution likes, but I, I feel very uncomfortable with that. I mean, to say something's consistent with is, is as wishy-washy as one can get. And, and the bottom line is, do we know for a fact the time she died? I don't believe so. I really don't believe so. And the fact that they, they say that the temperature in this area was... Uh, 40, 50, 60 degrees on some days. Why isn't there any decomposition? Why isn't there any insect activity, any maggot activity, uh, at more animal activity? It's kind of surprising to me that this body could lay out there for weeks and weeks and not have blowflies with uh, maggots or animals. The issue that both of you have brought up to me is liver mortis, right? This is an issue. So, Doc, why don't you explain to us what that is and let's look at the next uh, exhibit that corresponds with that. All right, li li live or mortis, I'll say live or, because okay. it, as a, liver sounds like your liver organ, so I'll say live or wish someone to told strain, me that before the show started, but okay. To, <laughs> to strain things. Live or mortis just, just means that when we die, most people will die on their back, like in the hospital or in a nursing home, and the blood will then go to the gravity dependent area. If you die on your back, the blood will go to your back and sit in capillaries, and then that blood will coagulate or get fixed so that 
it can't be blanched. By blanching, I mean if you press on your skin, it'll turn white from, from blanching. The pressure. From the pressure. Okay. You're pushing the blood out of the capillaries, and then it blanches. If the blood no longer blanches, then it's been sitting in those capillaries for six hours, eight hours, ten hours, depending on temperature and Before things. we had Dr. Mannion review the autopsy, Susan, you were the first person who recognized that there was an issue with this liver mortis. The liver mortis does not match how she was found in the grave. Um, the autopsy report says that she was found lying on her right side. That's consistent with what Dr. Rodriguez testifies to, although again, without his notes, there's very little to go on. But he says he could see her left hip exposed and her left foot um, and some of her hair, which shows that she was lying on her right side in that grave site. And the liver mortis was found frontally. And the trial, the Dr. Correll, she agrees that wherever she was when liver mortis was fixed, she was laying frontally, which means she was lying on her chest and not on her side. And what about the next exhibit we have with respect to the same issue? Uh, that is, I believe, the testimony at trial given by Dr. Correll in which she acknowledges that she doesn't give a timeline, but she does acknowledge that Hay was lying frontally whenever live are fixed, but there's a problem there with the timeline. Well, re remember, this is a body that supposedly was in the ground five or six weeks, and for a forensic pathologist, how many cases like this do you think we get in a year? Not very many. Right, right. So the more rare a case is, the more mistakes are going to be made. And again, we're depending on the police, the medical examiners depending on the police, and the, if the police come in with all this confidence saying, oh yeah, she was killed that day, dumped there, here in this grave, she was covered over by dirt and leaves, that's why there's no decomp, it was cold outside, then what, what the hell am I going to do? I'm a, I, I got another homicide to do after this one. So I'm dependent on what the police tell me. Now, in some jurisdictions in, uh, where I work, I have to go to the scene of that homicide, and that's a very, very good practice because that way, uh, I'll be called in the middle of the night, the police will pick me up, I'm, I'm at the scene, and that way I can s see exactly what the hell I'm going to confront when I do that autopsy. I'm not sure that happened in this jurisdiction. Dr. Aquino, one of the other doctors on the case, did go to the crime scene. He did observe it. He was not the one to testify at trial, but he was on the autopsy report. So okay. he Did he take notes? If he did, they were never disclosed. So. He was there at least to confirm the report's findings that she was on her right side. Um, based on your view of the autopsy and the photos, is it possible she was buried on her right side within 45 hours of death? Do you think? Well, if the live were, first of all, their pathologist saying the live were fixed anteriorly and on the chest. So that means when she died, she was face down. And therefore, she was dead for at least six hours, eight hours, 10 hours. Then, if you would put her on her right side, it wouldn't matter about the live or mortis, it's already fixed. Got it. So the blood's not going to move to the dependent portion of the body. Therefore, if she was lying face down for that amount of time and then taken to that grave and placed on her right side, that would make sense. She wasn't placed, she wasn't murdered and within an hour or so placed in that grave because then all the liver would be in the dependent portion, would be on the right side of her face, right shoulder. Susan, is what Dr. Mannion saying consistent with, hey, having been in the car for longer? What are your thoughts? The official story from Jay is that she was killed, placed pretzeled up in the trunk of a tiny Sentra, and then four to five hours later, she was laid out on her right side in the grave. Even though the liver mortis is not shown in more than one position, it's all frontal and it's all fixed there, which doesn't seem to be reconciled with the four to five hour timeline given by Jay. Yes, I, I had problems with the, the live mortis. Susan, yes. you brought up the clothing listed in the report, and this is actually in the previous exhibit that we were looking at, uh, autopsy one, live mortis. Why was that important? It's just another oddity from the case is that the autopsy report does not list her as being found with underwear on. There was underwear found at the crime scene. It's not clear where. Um, and either the medical examiner decided not to include that in a report, or there was underwear found in the scene that she wasn't wearing, and we just don't okay, know. Okay, so this is what I'm confused about. I thought that there was testimony, at least from the trial, that she was wearing tights. She was. Pantyhose. Pantyhose. So, um. so she was wearing pantyhose when she was found dead. 
without underwear? We don't know. It's it, there's no way to tell from the record. I will say though, from the photographs though, it, I it's really hard to make out. But there, it seemed like there might have been a possibility. Like I don't know if you noticed what was a possibility uh, that that she was she was wearing like it's maybe, hard to tell. Yeah, it, like a thong or like something very minimal. Like but some underneath kind of under the pantyhose. Yeah, I mean it's it's hard to tell from the photograph I have, but it seemed like it is a possibility. And maybe it just wasn't listed. Yeah. Um. Okay, so let's talk about the toxicology. Mm -hmm. Why is this important? The toxicology report that was done was very minimal. Um, all we know is there was a heart blood test for alcohol and drugs unspecified. Uh, and they were negative, but there's no more in-depth toxicology report. Why should there have been, in your opinion? This is not something... No, I, I yeah. agree, I agree. There should have been a more comprehensive report. For instance, uh, I would have looked for liver and done a, done a full drug screen. But, but Hay was, is, uh, Hay was never known to be a drug user or a drinker or anything. Why, why is this important? Well, date rape drug could have been used okay. to knock okay. her out. Good. Let's, let's get some more information. If that's happened, then, but that's a, that's a big piece of evidence there. Is she a chronic drug user? Because if she is, we can find metabolites of tetra of marijuana like weeks oh, after right, drug right. exposure. I, I agree, but there was never any indication that she used drugs or drank or anything. Susan? There are some indications that she did. That yeah. she did what? That she, she might have smoked weed. I mean, like this is what I understand okay. from um, Adnan is that she okay. occasionally did. I mean, okay. a lot of the kids did. He did, obviously. Um, and uh, but and there's some indication in her diary that might have been true. Again, we don't have um, parts of the diary because the electronic portion's missing. Um, so from what we know... So that then it does become significant that it wasn't mm -hmm. tested. And as you mentioned to me when you first looked at the report, the autopsy, you were wondering about the pulmonary edema and if the possibility of Yes, the I, they, they talk about... Do we have an exhibit for the pulmonary edema? We, do, we do, okay. One. Okay, do, we, do you want to show it now? Sure. I can show it now. Okay, so go ahead, Doc. Well, in a drug overdose, the drugs generally depress the respiratory center. And as the respiratory center is depressed, the person is breathing slower and slower. However, they're a young person, so they have good reserves. And as they breathe slower and slower, the lungs fill up with fluid. As it fills up with fluid, the fluid comes up the trachea, the airway, and then... <laughs> You actually get foam right. out of the mouth, and if that foam goes forward onto the clothing, then you can say that this is a part of severe drug overdose. Now, the other factor here, this may just be purging. In other words, uh -huh. as you die, the body's decomposing internally, and you'll get fluids purging out of any orifice, the nose and mouth. So I'm not sure if she's talking about you know, real pulmonary congestion and edema with a drug overdose, or if she's talking about purging, but whose blood is that? Why can't we check that blood? They did test the blood. So Let's just uh, put up the pulmonary edema exhibit, guys. Uh, I think it's number five or number four, right? So, so go ahead. I believe so. What they found was a old t-shirt in the, pa uh, the driver's seat area of her car that her brother testified was his shirt that she used as a general wiper rag. There was one blood stain found on it, not a very large one, but it was uh, went through the shirt, so no one was wearing it at the time. Um, and they showed a picture of this, this shirt to the medical examiner and asked her to say, is that pulmonary edema? And she says, it looks like it to me. Wow. I mean, it could be could be purging, could be somebody else's blood. I mean, come they did on. Test it. it was her. Well, it was her blood. It was her blood. All right. But there's no evidence other than her looking at it. And there was, was no evidence pulmonary. of blood actually in her mouth or in her nose. Also, they swabbed that. There was no blood found in the mouth. And she really didn't have any injuries to account for that that blood. Oh, speaking there. of injuries, let me ask you this: Was there anything in the autopsy report that indicated ligature marks from a rope? I don't believe so. I don't, okay. I don't think there was a rope involved here. And normally, you when you have a fracture involving the highway bone, the, uh, you, you're using hands and fingers to dig in deep and fracture the bone. I, I felt convinced that she was actually sitting in her car and was assaulted by someone in the passenger side. She was beaten around the head, and then the person could have been right-handed, grabbed her throat, strangled her so hard They'd actually fractured the hyoid on the left side. But, but not with one hand? Well, what with one hand? A man could certainly do that. She's five foot six, 135 pounds, and a man could certainly do that and fracture that bone. Then, now, the younger you are, the more flexible your cartilage <coughs> is, less bone, so it, it took some force to so do that. Is that easy to do in a car, though, in a cramped setting? 
Well, he's a big guy, 180, 200 pounds, can, can strangle a woman, yes. And I mean, there were no signs of struggle, so it might have been she was actually knocked out. I mean, she or, was or, yeah, down. that's what I mean. That's why I mean, the punches the first. Which is actually important. Mm -hmm. The punches first to the head would stun her, and as she's wondering what the hell's going on, oh, then she's. Yeah. Yeah. Can we look at the uh, exhibit strangled. on the, one the head blows? So the toxicology and head blows is in an exhibit together, yes. right? So let's look at, at that. Okay, so go back to what you were saying. So the autopsy report is consistent with someone having killed Hay while sitting in the passenger seat? That's what I believe. Yes, that's the most likely scenario. Is it possible? Scenario. Is there any reason to believe she had to have been in the car when she died? Well, oh, that's you, a good question. You can't. You, uh, is there any reason been, to think? We, we could have been sitting at this table and you punch me and then strangle me. But, but I'm just saying it seems awful coincidental that all her injuries are on the right side of her head uh, are both of these people are the suspects all right-handed? I mean, if I'm I attacking, so. right-handed. I think so. If I'm attacking somebody, I'm, I'm right-handed. I'm going to use my right fist. Normally, if I'm attacking you frontally, you'll have injuries to the left side of your head. Why are all her injuries on the right okay, side of her head? But do you think? You, I'm sorry, Rabia. You said that there was no signs of struggle. I mean that the, right. apparently there was no sign of struggle that she that, okay. that she would have indicated she was conscious of somebody struggling. No defensive her. wounds. So you defensive think wounds. the head blows could have just knocked her out? Absolutely, yeah. stunned her. Absolutely. You think the head not, blows not knocked her out? Go ahead, please. You um, get you get hit and your your bells rung. You know you're like, what the hell's going on? You you don't, you don't know where you are and that fast. Somebody grabs your throat. See, I think it 15, makes sense that it happened seconds, before you're out. she got out of the car. Go ahead, Rabia. No, my question is, um, do you think the head blows were consistent with somebody? I mean, were they severe enough that uh, it seemed like something was used to hit her, and not a, simply a fist? Could be with a fist. Could right. be with a fist. There's no skull fracture. Okay. There's no. All the Im injuries are underneath this the scalp. Yeah. There's no injury to the brain. There's no subdural hematoma, subarachnoid hemorrhage. No skull fracture. So more like a fist, a soft object, right. could cause that. Susan? Mm -hmm. No. Actually, the, what's interesting is the prosecution's theory is that she was in the passenger seat when she yeah. died. Because of testimony that Jay said she kicked, she kicked the, uh, the turn signal or something when she was... All right, you're in the passenger <laughs> seat, I'm in the driver's seat. Where are all the injuries going to be? It should have been the left side. On the opposite side. Where Susan's getting really I grab your beat up throat. on this special edition <laughs> of Docket. I'm left-handed. That's going to... I mean, I can bear down. It's going to be a lot harder, but... It's possible. Okay, so just t take me through this. Both of you remind me. Uh, what, sense. if the prosecution's theory was that Hay was in the passenger side, then how did the medical examiner's testimony reconcile with that theory? It didn't have to. <laughs> it it was not challenge. Yeah. They were, there's, there's a side issue here, some complications about the turn signal or wiper that's broken. Initially, wow. wait. Why was she in the passenger seat? Because, they, because the state says says it. They, I mean, so the, he the, was the, driving. The, their theory is their that theory, Adnan was driving. Yeah. Yeah. Initially, they said uh, Jay tells them that the the windshield wiper was broken. That's how would we know that. It, it, Adnan decided to tell him and decided to mention the fact that there's broken. So the left side, he says, is broken. Um, but if they want to have the passenger seat theory, there's no way she could have broken that. So they then kind of changed it to the right side, it was broken. But they did a test on it forensically, and they found no signs that it was broken at all. Um, and based on the record, we can't tell now which one is broken. Hayes, and whether it was a windshield wiper or a turn signal. Hayes' brother now says he's pretty, he believes, he remembers totally, that it was the actual turn signal, which was on the left side, that was broken. So the state's theory that she was in the right, in the passenger seat. Which might be consistent with her being in the driver's seat. Though. Yeah. Was, I do, I'm was sorry, Was the switch ahead. broken? You mean the... Or the, the light was broken. I mean, if there was a struggle, maybe she grabbed for something and broke it broke it that way. I mean, there seemed to be indications that it was, the, the whole handle was like sagging. It was, it was, mm -hmm. it would not hold up. All right, well, then she might have reached out as she's being assaulted to grab something and broken it right there. Mm -hmm. that, that, to me, I, she's, in the driver, she's in the driver's seat when she's assaulted. Is there, if it occurred in the car. Right. And there's no other evidence because they didn't do that much swabbing of inside the car there's, that she was in the yeah. driver's seat at that time. There's no direct evidence that she was in the car at the time that she was killed. Before I forget, I want to ask you about the rape kit. There was, there was a rape kit taken, yes. right? Okay, and that is something that's common in doing a forensic autopsy? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, and just we explain a little bit about that. We only have a few minutes left, but I, do, yes. I, think, it's, I think it's significant. We do oral swabs, anal swabs, and vaginal swabs looking for sexual assault, and you try to get as thorough a sample as possible. Now, in the, in the old days, we would, if a rape 
if a homicide was recent, we would make a smear also and try to look for sperm. If the sperm are motile, then that the sperm were placed there uh, within 24 hours. Sperm can move for about 24 hours in a dead body in a, in a moist environment. If the sperm are present but don't move, then they, they've been there for more than 24 hours. Uh, in the old days, we just used to look at sperm. Now we're more interested in the DNA, and I'm still curious if those swabs are around. Has anybody ever checked them for DNA? They're trying to find them. I don't know if they have been found. I mean, the appeals they, they, they should be there. They should exist. I mean, we know that the police collected them. I mean, I mean we, there we, was a report, though, that they said that in 2010... That they couldn't find them. They, oh, okay, but just what... what is curious is that usually the uh, autopsy, when they do the autopsy, they take the rape kit and then the autopsy doc sends the rape kit to the forensic biology unit and they test those swabs and smears. Was that done? For DNA. That was not done. And Do you have any idea why? The, the, she that, looked for have, sperm. I mean, I'm, I'm, no, it's no, easy you, to be a Monday morning quarterback, but just because there aren't sperm there doesn't mean anything to me. The sperm could have degenerated. So my question for a body is, do you have a there problem? For six weeks. Do you have a problem with the fact that the samples from the rape kit were not tested at that time? Yes, I do. They should have been checked for DNA. And if somebody and, else's DNA showed up just, there, then that's a big piece of evidence. Okay, Dr. Manu, before yeah. I uh, wrap up, anything? Final words, final thoughts. I looked at Who this case. It? I looked at this case independently, and I said I don't like this Haddon guy as the suspect, and uh, I like Wilds. I mean, I'm with you. I like. I, 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 I can't I've, say I've for sure, feel but Jay, Susan. I'm independent. I didn't hear anybody else, and that's what I. I know. Thought. I know. And and yeah. and you didn't listen to the podcast. Right. At this point, it's I, hard I to rule anything thought, out. I think I've always thought Jay. Do you think Jay? I have always thought Jay. Now I think. It is possible. It's also possible there's a third party very close to Jay. Um, and then there's, a, there's this remote possibility that Jay had absolutely nothing to do with anything. And the police then how would kind of... How would Jay, they, Jay took him to the car? There, well, well, that's not clear either. Uh, there is that. evidence that points the other way. Yeah, that the police might have taken Jay to the car. Really? <laughs> at least, at least I, I knew where the car was. Are we going to get are we going to get the big reveal on the podcast? Uh, we're going to explore it for sure. Okay, so uh, thank you all for joining us today and uh, folks at home, so stay tuned to uh, the view from ll2.com or splitthemoon.com so you will find out about the podcast and if you missed our previous special where we dissected the cell phone evidence go to our show page msnbc.com forward slash the dash docket and if you want us to do another serial special please tweet us at shift msnbc using hashtag the docket and you can tweet me at sema iresq catch our regularly scheduled show every tuesday 11 a.m on shift by msnbc this is the docket. Hey, YouTube fans, I'm Luke Russert. Thanks for checking out our MSNBC channel. Subscribe by clicking right here and click any of the videos over here to watch the latest breaking news, mini documentaries, conversations from Shift, and other digital exclusives. Check it out.